comedy land, and welcome to the Jimmy Curve. Uh, I am the host, Jimmy Putnam, and with me on the Jimmy Curve are my co-hosts, Joshua Vossler. Hello, everybody. And Will Doherty. This is the sound of my voice. Mm, and a lovely sound it is. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in, downloading, listening in the next room with your ear to the wall, or however you're picking this up. Uh, I'm quite frankly blown away by how many people listened to the pilot that we uh, dropped last week. We we had like 130 downloads or hits on the site, uh, which is way more than the four that I thought were going to listen. Uh, thank you for liking our page on Facebook, The Jimmy Curve, and also for following us on Twitter, at The Jimmy Curve. Uh, I'm very excited at the support we've received so thank you, friends and family. For for those of you who don't understand how incredible that is, 130 people is more people than have ever gone to a comedy show in Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> right. Yeah, or possibly in Nebraska. Well, the funny bone, I guess, would probably draw more than 130. But it's a, it's 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 a lot of people. Uh, how well? Yeah, how many people went and saw Doug Benson when he was at the Bourbon? Probably a lot. Anyways, <laughs> it, it, it feels like a lot to me. Uh, one of, also, uh, my mom gave me a call the next day after we <laughs> posted the link and said, Hey, I listened to your uh, podcast. Great job. I loved it. And I was like, yeah, what? I hope I didn't say anything incriminating, but I don't. Goddamn. Uh, and I'm so glad that if nothing else, I can continue to make your life even fucking better. Yes. Jesus Christ. <laughs> so uh, my wife, uh, my wife really showed support by not even downloading it. <laughs> <laughs> so hi, mom, and uh, eventually hi, Josh's wife. I want to, I want to tell you a story about your mom. It's not a story about your mom. <laughs> Get ready, mom. That was just trash talking on Xbox Live. That was a different thing. <laughs> Um, when I was in college, which is another one of my old dreams that are dead, uh, mm. a friend of mine, uh, was like, you know, did like a night, like radio DJ thing on the college radio station. And he had me on like the college radio station as a guest. And I don't remember what we were talking about. Some filth of some <laughs> kind. Of course. But his pastor mother was like <laughs> listening to the show and she like had called in to ch like give him a little bit of shit about like how filthy his little radio yeah. show had gotten because yeah. I was there. And I don't rem I don't know what the joke means, but I know that it's still hilarious to me because I went on there to talk about the fact that his pastor mom had called in. Mm -hmm. And what I said after apologizing profusely was, your oral sex is in the mail. <laughs> I'm still Fabulous. not sure what that means. The, the first time. Uh, me neither, but sign <laughs> me up. <laughs> <laughs> the first time uh, my parents ever saw me do improv, they came to uh, the Backline Improv Theater during Omaha. Omaha, It was like a Omaha Improv Festival. And I was in, at the time, this was like a year and a half ago, I was in a, a really great team, and we had a really great show. But it just so happened to be a show in which Rachel Ware uh, shouted the word cunt like 16 times in a row which has never happened in one of our shows or has ever happened since in that group. It was just that particular show. It somehow came up. She really tries to top out at yelling cunt about 10 times in a <laughs> row. Usually it's not, a, it's not, it's uh, it's not a word I ever say, uh, but there you go. That's the, that's, let's start off with a bang. Hey, hey everybody. Thanks for listening. See you later. Too bad. You had to go. So, um, <laughs> Uh, oh, but I am really super excited that everyone is listening and uh, that I do have supportive friends and family and occasionally supportive comedian acquaintances. So that's that's very nice to know. Uh, let's get into it. Uh, I, I wanted to start off by telling a story about a thing that happened to me this last weekend. Uh, I, you know what? I should throw out the date that we're recording this just so everybody knows. Uh, it is Wednesday, the September 17th. Our intention is to release an episode every... It is not Wednesday. Technically, like, according to the law, it's Wednesday. But I have a very specific policy that if you're not asleep, it's not tomorrow yet. Right. Okay, so this is Tuesday night. Fucking at... A it is. All right. 
Tuesday, the I don't know. I just I just moused over the the thing and it pulled up the date and I just read that. I didn't actually process information. So when you started talking, I got really confused. I was like, it's twelve oh five. It's technically what it, it, was he going forward or backward in time? Anyways, you threw me for a loop. <laughs> so uh, our intention is to release an episode every Thursday. Is that what we agreed on? Is that what we thought we could manage? I agree with that. <laughs> I think Thursdays are a great day. So hopefully we'll release an episode every Thursday and post the link to uh, at the Jimmy Curve Twitter handle and also Facebook. uh, And we'll put up the links as many places as we can and you can download and listen. And hopefully it'll be on iTunes soon. Okay, so anyways, I wanted to talk about a thing that happened to me this last weekend. Because I think it's in, because that's the format of the show is I introduce uh, the host and then I talk about me for 30 minutes. I had the chance to go down to Kansas City uh, to do an improv show at a place called Comedy City, which, by the way, is a fantastic theater. So if anybody who's listening to this uh, is in Kansas City and wants to go see a great comedy show Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, check out Comedy City because it is it was great and the experience was great. So we did our improv show. Our, our group's performance was... Mm-hmm, and then after the show... Uh, I was informed that there was a different improv show on a different part of Kansas City. And at the after party of that show, Paul F. Tompkins was there. And Paul F. Tompkins is one of my favorite comedians. I'm a huge, huge fan. And I think most people who do stand-up comedy or comedy of any kind are huge fans of Paul F. Tompkins. Uh, He's a... uh, a great writer. I'm, I'm, I'm ranting so hard. I'm getting out of breath. He's a great writer, uh, and he's an uh, even better performer. But so everybody there announced we're going to go across town and go to this after party, and we're going to meet Paul F. Tompkins. And my response was like, Oh God, that just no, I don't want to do it. Like he doesn't need me coming up to him and being like, Oh, this is the biggest fan. Can we take a picture? You know, when everybody's at this party is gathered in a tight circle around him trying to impress him or laugh at his jokes going out of their way to you know be witty and you know it just the whole thing just sounded awful and it sounded like a huge hassle to me and so I was like no I don't want to do that oh, he doesn't need me there this, is, this sounds awful like I'm not he's going to be a big mess and then my friend Joe Carey said yeah or you could just go talk to him and I thought yeah, that's how a normal person with self-esteem would handle this situation. Uh, they would just, you know, something exciting would happen, and they allow themselves to be excited about it and have fun without, you know, self-analyzing every single... Like, I, I don't know if it's that I feel that being around me is a burden to bear, <laughs> or if I was just... I, I don't know what it was that I couldn't... I just couldn't allow myself to go have fun and be excited about a situation. Is that me that's the problem? I mean, I feel like that's a lot of comedians. I mean, your friend who said that, is he a is he a comic person? Yeah, he's a comedian, improviser. Okay, well, an improviser. But improvisers, I feel like, have a very different kind of tenor about them than uh, stand-up comedians. Like, improvisers... Like if you do if you do improv, it's a community activity. Right. Like stand up is specifically yourself against the audience. Is that is it, it feels that combative to you? In a lot of ways, well, like, yeah, it's like yeah. I mean, and the the you know it's the same way like the terminology that supports it. I mean, I'm not the first person to observe this, but like you know that's what it's combative terminology. Like I killed, I slaughtered, right. like, and that's the that's kind of like a, I think the uh, comedian's mindset. And I think there's like a negativity that kind of breeds into that a little bit, you know, as opposed to as opposed to like an improviser where like the the fucking credo for improvisers is literally yes and. Right. Yeah. And we're sort of all putting on this show together and having a community experience. That may be it. I mean, my friend Joe is a pretty I mean, he does some stand up and he does sketch and all of those things, too. It was more it wasn't even about that. It was more just that. Even the even my friends who I was with, there was no sort of like. I I don't know if it's selfishness. I I I for some reason I had to make it about me. Like I couldn't just enjoy sort of meeting one of my comedy heroes, you know, or whatever. Or like this guy who I respect and I you know would like to get his thoughts on this thing. And for me, an interaction is never just about 
I talk and then you talk. It's always about I talk and you talk while I'm self-analyzing the whole time in a really intense and depressing way because I have no self-esteem. And it's not, and everything is not even just the worst case scenario. It's about even the best case scenario. I just couldn't envision a scenario where that went well, where I came out of that after party and thought, boy, that was a good decision. I'm happier for it. I even, just, even though, go ahead. I just think it'd be like, for me, I, I would, wouldn't probably do it either because for to me it's be like a double-edged sword because i'd feel like some sort of obligation to try and be funny right but then i realize like people probably do that all the time and he's just like this everybody just puts it on in front of me and it has to be annoying you know what i mean well and like he, and i wouldn't right. it wouldn't be organic to, it wouldn't feel organic and uh, it'd feel awkward and right. i don't and I, I think and plus like comedian stand-up comedians in general like to be approved you know they want right. approval and like somebody whatever that means you know what i mean yeah like especially with an audience but then like you have somebody that you is well known i feel like maybe do i need to impress this guy or should i not give a shit well that's hard for me not to give a shit because i really do care about what people think about me you know even right. though i might pretend i don't i do right of course well and i think in a situation like this to me it was just it seemed like all the other people around me, like when Joe said that, he was just like, yeah, or we could just go talk to him. I was like, I'm so jealous of your ability to just enjoy a thing in a way that I don't have. I just don't allow myself to get excited or feel purely happy. It's always, well, yeah, this is a great thing, but then it's going to end and then it's over and I then I have to move on to another thing. And, you know, it's never just... I'm never in the moment with something like that because I think there was no thought process of, oh, I'm going to get something out of this. Like, I think the people who went over there weren't interested in getting something from Paul F. Tompkins. And the reality of it, too, is that it was an after party. So if Paul F. Tompkins didn't want to be there, he could have left. So he was there, you know, with a full understanding of how it was going to go. Like, he knows that. When he goes to a party in Kansas City full of local comedians, he knows how that's going to go. And he was fine with it because he was there. So there was no reason for me to have all of these hang-ups except I can't not have them. <laughs> it's just how I'm always going to be. See, uh, I want to explain, like, something about me. Like, I feel like this is the difference. This kind of, like, illustrates the difference between me and you. This mm. is why this is why your segment you're just the it's just the Jimmy curve mm -hmm. and for me my segment is Will Doherty makes you sad. True. Cuz I have the same anxiety but I have that anxiety with you. <laughs> no. See, you're right to laugh. <laughs> like I feel like I'm imposing on this show right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, well we're not going to say you're not. That's <laughs> Kind of, that, kind of what you're here for. Because we don't want to make you any sadder. <laughs> no, you already no. Are, if that's possible. <laughs> it's just, yeah, Will Doherty just dropped an awkward bomb. <laughs> <laughs> no, Will, you're fine. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. See, it got so yeah. when you tr when you felt like you had to be comforting, then it got then <laughs> yeah. like the the true sadness <laughs> descended upon the. Yeah. Uh, no. No, so. we like you, Will. So what's so <laughs> this, this show this this show took a fucking turn on us <laughs> a a, a co-host directional turn but serious like what is the proper protocol in that situation if somebody like meeting a celebrity has always felt weird to me and part of it is just the sort of adolescent counterculture punk rock mentality of like man I don't need this in my life you know or like what makes him so special? But now that I'm 36, it just, the, the whole thing always feels like a hassle to me. Or like, there's some procedure that I don't understand or wasn't informed about that I should know that everyone else knows. I don't know why it seems so weird to me. I'll tell you why it seems so weird to me. Uh, because in the very limited amount of time I've been doing stand-up, like, 
I've done some shows, and I've had done some shows that went very well, and I've occasionally had some people who wanted to come up to me after the show and say, hey, I want to shake your hand. You did a really good show. Right. And even though that was very kind of them, I still was weird as fuck about it, <laughs> and I don't want to do that to other people. Right, yeah. Like, I, and... and I un- like I have to like that's just me projecting my neuroses onto other people. That's me assuming other people are as uncomfortable with me as I am with life. You know what? That's a good point. Go ahead. No, I I just think like I would have to deter. I don't. You shouldn't have to determine what you're going to talk about before you just go up and say hi to someone. Right. But it's hard not to sometimes because well, especially somebody like that. I guess, I guess especially around here. Like if we live in like L.A. or New York probably wouldn't be as big of a deal with that sort of mindset you know you know what i mean but like around here it's like oh my god he was on tv (laughs) you know i've seen him on the on the small screen that's a you know that's a big deal well i think will brings up an interesting point too which is uh, I, i i wasn't relating these two topics but i am terrible at taking compliments like i am much better at being insulted but when someone compliments me in a very genuine way, I get extremely uncomfortable. And I feel like I have to argue almost, which is a very bizarre neurosis. Like when someone says, you know, like I had a couple people after we released that pilot come up and be like, good show. And my immediate response is, nah, they'll get better. You know, like I feel like I have to argue. <laughs> and I don't know why. That's so, biz- isn't that weird? Is that a self esteem thing? Is that. Because, like, I feel part of it is low self-esteem, but part of it is this sort of societal politeness that we've all been dunked into, and it now it's run wild and it's out of control. I think it's very Midwestern, really. Like, I think it's almost a Nebraska kind of attitude. This is like Nebra- This is what we were discussing on another thing we haven't <laughs> released yet, where we talked about the concept of Nebraska nice, which is where... <laughs> People in Nebraska do things where they think they think they're being nice, but really they're just in the way. Like it, it, it rears its ugly head in traffic a lot. It's almost like we got to prove it. Like, ah, uh, yeah, you know, they say Nebraska nice, but you know what? I really am, and I'm gonna show everybody and get it. Like, yeah, and then you become in the way, and then it just becomes. Where's that guy who's standing in the doorway of a restaurant holding it open, and you're like, I, I can open a door. You're, you're in the way. You're I don't even the... want to go into this place. What are you doing? <laughs> I don't even want to go in. That's funny. No. Don't wave me across the intersection. You have the right of way. We have laws. God damn it. Jesus, that is the worst. We got... Mary and I were on a walk, uh, like, a couple days ago, and we almost got run over because we were at one of those places where there's a, a sidewalk that crosses a street, and there's a stop sign for the pedestrians. But a lady in a van had pulled up to the crosswalk. She had no stop sign, and she was trying to wave us across. And I was like, no, you go. I was pointing back at her. She waved at us again, and then I pointed at the stop sign, and then I pointed at myself, like, vehemently, (laughs) and then, and she still refused to go, and then two other vehicles had stopped behind her, and they were, she was now holding up traffic, and she waved us across again, I walked over and I started slapping the stop sign. <laughs> and I was like, we, and I started yelling. I was like, we have a stop sign. You fucking go. And then she still didn't go. And then a person from the other side of the street on the sidewalk, like crossing the opposite way, got reached the street at this time, kind of saw what was happening and just started crossing. So at this point, I just threw up my arms and I and I was like, fuck it, we're going. And I kind of grabbed Mary and we started crossing the street. It was just a two lanes, like a small street. And as we were passing in front of this minivan, when we were almost past the van, she leaned on the horn and then slammed on the gas and almost hit us, like, like floored it and drove past us. And I turned around and I was like, what the fuck? But like she was gone down the street. Like she kind of peeled out and took off. And I was just like... What was going on inside your head that you thought that this was the best way to handle the situation? You caused huge amounts of problems because I, I'm sure it started out as a genuine, I'm trying to be courteous, but then she just dug in her heels and refused to yield. And like, we went to war. <laughs> it was crazy. Like, I'm I'm almost, like, like I'm kind of angry about it, but... 
I was so stunned at the time. I was just kind of like, what the fuck just happened there? How did that go south so terribly? <laughs> she's probably she's probably like, he's not Nebraska nice enough. <laughs> I'm sure that lady went home and was like, you won't believe these assholes who refused to cross the street. And then I had to honk and try to hit them with the van. I mean, I don't I don't know what her rationalization in her head was. Like, I'm sure it was something that has to do with pedestrians have the right of way. But the thing is. There were huge signs on the street that told us who was supposed to go. There was no, there should have been no argument. Like once she saw that we understood that an octagon that's red with the word stop in it means that we're supposed to stop. Once she saw that we understood that, just go. Like what did she think we were going to do? Like once she started to roll forward, like I was just going to sprint out and like dive and do like a barrel roll in front of her van. Like what did she think was going to happen? Ugh. You're you're just staring at me in stunned silence. I, I'm just, mostly. All right. Okay. Let's, that is over, Jimmy. That is that is. That done. reminds me of the time when I lost my shit in a Panera because because <laughs> this kid. So all right, I gotta tell this. That's story how now. every good story starts. <laughs> so we went. There's a Panera that's like a, a 35 minute walk from uh, my house. That I I like Panera a lot, and I like taking walks. I like to walk down there, and so. I went there one time, uh, and it was, again, I was with Mary. I was with my wife. And we we walked into a Panera. Now, inside of Panera, there are two different sort of uh, order stations. There's the bakery where you get, like, you know, cookies and bagels and stuff. And then sort of the restaurant area where there are a couple of registers, and you can walk up there to the counter, and you order your food. So I we walked up to the register, and we stood at the register for probably – I mean, it feels like a long time. It felt like 10 minutes. It was probably more like a minute and a half or something. Like, Because that time sort of draws out when you're getting frustrated with shitty service. So we were standing at the register while three people stood behind the counter discussing a television show and doing nothing else. So after this goes on, and it was like, it, it looked, it was like three high school kids. It looked like uh, these two like high school girls and then a really effeminate guy and they were just like talking about project runway or the real housewives of something or whatever i don't know i was so blind with rage so so then what happened is <laughs> i can't believe i'm telling the story uh so a girl from the bakery side said uh excuse me sir i can take your order down here and we walked over there and i stopped and i pivoted and i walked back to the other register and i was like hey you saw me standing here, right? And the kid kind of looks at me and he goes, oh, were you ready to order? And I was like, yeah, what the fuck do you think I'm doing standing here? And he goes, oh, well, you should have said something. And I was like, it's not my obligation. So I, I actually engaged him <laughs> in actual debate about how orders are supposed to be taken at Panera Bread Company. But I was red with fury and... And then, and then he dug in his heels and was like, you should have said something. And I was like, I don't have to go chasing down an employee when it's my turn to order. You're supposed to see me. What else would I be doing here? And he's like, well, I didn't know you were ready to order. And we went back and forth like until I had to make the decision. I either need to leave or I'm going to jail because I'm going to attack this fucking kid. And all this shit was running through my head where I was like, this kid hates his stepdad and that's who he thinks he's talking to right now like <laughs> as soon as he saw me he just thought fuck this guy no way am i helping this guy because he had other because he was not he you would not act like that unless you have other issues which i am now the embodiment of i am still angry about that situation and that was like three or four years ago or, like, uh, a manager or something told him, like, hey, this stuff sells itself. And he actually, like, took it to heart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what his problem was. I can't imagine being an employee and somebody comes up and stands at the register and you just don't say anything. Like, that to me felt like an aggressive move. <laughs> it felt like an attack. Because if you walk up to the counter of a restaurant, like, if you go into a subway... And you walk up to the register, somebody is supposed to say, 
Can I take your order? How can I help you? Something. They don't just stand there and stare at you or, like, ignore you from across the room. I, I don't know. I, I, yeah, you're not, never exiting a parking garage and they never open the window to take your ticket. They're like, <laughs> what do you want? And no, you know, that's like, that's because that's their job. Right. Yeah. If you're touring Jurassic Park, the dinosaurs are supposed to come out and say hi. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know. That was a weird analogy. <laughs> See, I like <sighs> as, as a uh, as I'm pretty sure the only minimum wage employee here. <laughs> uh, from the other side of the counter, I I can say like my general rule is I never get mad at anyone who's not making a living wage. That's kind of my broad policy. Sure. Uh, with a high school kid, it's kind of different, both because I feel okay about them not making a minimum wage or like a living wage, like they're not earning a living they're just a fucking high school kid so it doesn't matter but at the same time they're also just a high school kid so high school kids are gonna be shitty i know i went to high school right but this isn't about being a good employee this is just a matter of a weird aggressive lack of common courtesy like this was a this was passive aggressiveness Okay, see, like, I don't care how good you are at your job. Like, I used to be the assistant manager of a bookstore, and they used to send us all of these sort of sales goals. Like, you're supposed to average this number of items per transaction. You're supposed to average this dollar amount per transaction. And if you're not meeting those goals, you're supposed to upsell people and offer them more and more items at the register. And I had a, we had a high school girl working for us one time, and, like, after we got this big lecture from the sort of regional manager, she kind of turned to me and was like, you don't really expect me to do all that, do you? And I was like, no, I don't. I don't. Because you're, <laughs> you're fucking 16 and you don't, you don't get, this isn't your career. Like, you don't give a shit. You, you're just there to fucking duck your head and do the work and then go the fuck home and get high or okay. whatever. I don't know. I feel, I'm, I'm, I feel really stupid now. I'm going to ask an honest question. Do it. What are you upselling at a bookstore? Like, it's not right. like you're like, hey, do you want to add a fucking milkshake with that? Like, uh, I know. It, it, it was all this stuff. Like, we had, like, these bins of sort of candy, like those Linder balls and, like, chocolate and stuff. And we're supposed to upsell them. Like, do you want a piece of chocolate with that or a piece of candy with that? Like, we were supposed to do that. Or hey, if you're, you're like, buying books, you seem lonely, need some chocolate. <laughs> well, in so many books, such a huge amount of our business was, like, series romance. So that was an easy one. When someone would come in, you know, we'd say, you know, that author has whatever these other books, and you know, we've got these deals. Or I mean, it's all I don't even. Fucking Did so you long have ago. ice cream? <laughs> like, no. just like, hey, as long as you're buying three romance novels, you might as well right. get your pint of Ben and Jerry's here. Well, they would, and they would send us all of these things, like you know, you know, it's fantasy football season. Do you need a magazine or whatever? Like this dumb shit. But like nobody did it because you know what I heard, Daniel uh. Stell. Daniel, was it? What's her name? Steele. Did you know? Do you know what I heard? Daniel Steele also likes Hershey Kisses. Do you want some Hershey Kisses? <laughs> she eats them. That actually was the script. Okay. We got. <laughs> was it the memo? I think that is a good time to draw the rant segment to a close of this show. Uh, it's gone on long enough. W- what I would like to do now is attempt a new segment no- that we're going to call Will Doherty Makes You Sad. So, uh, I have a little jingle to play. Let's try it. Will Doherty makes you sad. Okay, so now we got a jingle. <laughs> there we go. God, that's, our, that... that's, our, that's our first drop. <laughs> that was depressing. I am fucking on board. <laughs> All right. So, Will Doherty already made it sad earlier. But this is going to be a sadness on a less profound, but more like, you know, kind of like simple emotional level Mm. which is i have a lot of words of like the sadness is not from me the sadness is what you feel about me as i express my genuine enthusiasm for taco bell's new dollar menu Mm, i'm I'm halfway there this might be the most exciting thing in my life right now uh They've got, like, because all the other dollar menus are kind of, like, going to shit. How, how new is the Taco Bell dollar menu? Like, a, a couple weeks at best. Ooh, I didn't even know about this. I'm actually genuinely excited. 
Okay, yeah. So, well, yeah, because what's happening is that all the other fast food joints, like, they all established, like, hey, we're doing dollar menus because we got to do that because we have to compete on price because the economy's taking a shit. Mm -hmm. Nobody's paying for the whole Whopper anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but then, like, the dollar menu started getting, like, too price, like, they couldn't afford it anymore. It was, like, shit was getting too expensive. Uh, and then, you know, McDonald's started ratcheting it up, the price of the double cheeseburger. <laughs> At first, the double cheeseburgers went up to $1.29, but then they replaced it with the McDouble, mm. which was just a shittier bullshit double cheeseburger. Right. Whatever. It was still a dollar, so I was fine. Mm -hmm. Now... The fucking double cheeseburger has gone all the way up to like 149. The McDouble is like 129. <laughs> you can't even get a cheeseburger on the dollar menu anymore. This is horseshit. Yeah, this is yeah. Although, like conceptually, the idea of like a loss leader, which for those of you who haven't spent as much time reading Forbes on the shitter as I have, <laughs> a loss leader at a business is when they like <laughs> take a product at this business that they sell at a loss with the idea being that, like, the special or the promotion is going to get people in the door. They're going to spend money on something that makes money, too. So yeah. at a fast food joint, you buy a McDouble for a dollar. McDonald's doesn't make any money on that. Right, but, but they're killing then, it on... Yeah, but then if you whatever. buy a soda for a dollar twenty nine, yeah. then like that's they, three they've made cents. A dollar, they've made a dollar twenty eight off of that or something. Yeah, exactly. Right. But, like... The idea, this is why, like, I'm, this is one of the many reasons why I am incredibly overweight, uh, is that the idea of a loss leader at a restaurant, at a, like a fast food joint, mm -hmm. gives me a boner. Like, <laughs> I so love the idea of beating McDonald's by eating <laughs> more than I paid for. Yeah, that is if, exciting. Like, if I could see like their internal di like if i knew for a fact that a mcchicken cost exactly a dollar which is exactly what i paid for it i would eat four of them for every meal <laughs> <laughs> and that would be it is it are you really trying to stick it to the man or do you just fucking love mcchickens and do you have four dollars um <laughs> i do have four dollars that's what i mean he's like like it, it, this, this is a technical problem more than an emotional one. I'm, I'm I'm thinking. Yeah, you're not eating the sandwich. You're eating the deal in which you got the sandwich. <laughs> like I can't get enough of this deal. Yeah. I want to back up for a second too. It is weird to me when people refer to fast food places as restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> I just that sounds so strange. Is that it, just me? No, you're absolutely right. <laughs> like, and I hope insulting to and restaurants. I hope you're feeling the sadness that you're supposed to be doing <laughs> as I explain to you that I have to refer to it as a restaurant, otherwise I wouldn't ever get to eat at restaurants. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but so that's why the prices have been going up at all the other fast food, like all the dollar menus are starting to fall away as they get replaced by McDonald's dollar menu and more. Fuck you, I know what you just did. All right, now it's just stuff that's more expensive, and that's a goddamn lie. <laughs> but now, fucking Taco Bell swooped in to save the day. Mm, like a hero. Well, the tr like the true south-of-the-border hero they are. <laughs> so they have a new dollar menu. What they also have, though, is like these like baby combo meals. They've had these forever. They used to be two dollars. Mm. Uh, now they're two forty nine, but I don't begrudge them that. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, they're like baby combos, and they have like one item, like a taco or a burrito, and then like this piddly little bag of chips and a drink, and that's two fifty for what a normal person would call a lunch. <laughs> right. But now with their new dollar menu, here's how it works for me: uh, two fifty baby combo menu. And two dollar menu burritos. Awesome. And I have enough starch that I can feel somewhat satisfied <laughs> for under five dollars. And that's like my psychological threshold. If I ate dinner for under five dollars and I don't actively want to eat more, then I won. <laughs> Let me ask you a very important technical question. Sure. It is twelve thirty five AM. Mm -hmm. uh, we are at How my house. How far away is the nearest taco? Can't, is is there one that is open that I can get to? Uh, I know I don't know if there's one that's closer, but I know the one on Twenty Seventh Street is still. 
Whereabouts on 27th Street? Uh, 27th and Cornhusker. So we have some distance to travel. You should go and then just order the Will Doherty. <laughs> they probably know him by name already. Taco Bell at 27th and Cornhusker. Prepare yourself for a visit. Oh, God. It's so the, the cheese and it's like the cheese and rice burrito. I'm a little disappointed in myself. I didn't think I could embrace something that wasn't full of almost meat. <laughs> but I it's love still cheese and rice delicious. burritos. Oh, yeah. And. Uh, cheese and beans and rice and it's mm. spicy and it's delicious. But the other thing I like the beef and Frito burrito. Now that's a treat because I uh. like <laughs> I like me some burritos because they got more of that starch you need to fill the emptiness where yeah. the joy is supposed to be. Correct. Uh, but I also miss the texture. That's what you like about a taco. It's crispy. It's got that <laughs> texture. You throw some Fritos in there, now you got a little crispy on your giant <laughs> pile of starch. That's what I need. Now That's also a product integrating. I watch, uh, like, they uh, interviewed the CEO of PepsiCo, and they own Frito-Lay, and they own, sure. they own KFC, they own Taco Bell, amongst, mm-hmm. you they know, own 300 own other Pizza companies. Hut. Right, they own uh, coincidentally, can I tell you something about that? Uh, I, were, as you know, as we've established earlier, uh, Pizza Hut delivery driver over here. Uh, I took a delivery from my Pizza Hut to the Taco Bell, <laughs> at which I frequently drown my shame. They paid me out of the register, <laughs> which means that, like, Pizza Hut and Taco Bell, both like the parent company is Yum. Inc. So Yum Inc. bought a pizza from itself and paid me to deliver it, it to it, itself. It's sort of like the company just found a way to have a net loss in taxes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good scam. Yeah. And that has been Will Dor. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if we were going to do that or uh. not. We're going to do it. It, it. Okay. And a three, two, one. Will, Will, Dorothy oh, makes know we were... you sad. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if we were going to do the row, row, row your vote thing or not. I fucked it up again. Let's move on. <laughs> I want to do one more final segment. And uh, you know what? Let, let's just, we'll just throw this out. Like, we'll edit that last shit out of there. We won't, but I'll throw that out. <laughs> I'll claim we will. Last segment I want to do, I am calling Love Hate. This is just going to be really quick. We're going to go around and we're going to talk about things that we hate, that everyone else loves, because that's how I interact with the world, and it sounds like fun to me. Uh, We encourage you to send in your version of love-hate. These are things that you hate, that everyone else loves. Don't tell me how much you hate the movie The Room, or Troll 2, or how much you hate Katy Perry music. Everyone understands why those things are hateable. Like, we want to hear why you hate things that everyone else you know likes. Uh, and then tweet it out with the hashtag uh, love hate and tag at the Jimmy Curve. Uh, and, or send an email to the Jimmy Curve at gmail.com. You can email us that. In fact, email us anything and we'll talk about it on this show. We just want to hear from you. So, uh, Josh, why don't you start us out? We're so lonely. <laughs> we are very, yeah. yeah. Okay, I will start off with uh, the movie The Notebook. I have never seen The Notebook, but I, when I worked at a bookstore, it was one of the most popular books. Oh, it's a book. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but oh, oh, you have to read the book. The book is so much better. <laughs> it was by Nicholas Sparks. Uh, he writes cheesy romance novels that uh, middle-aged married women love. Well, I find, I find that even men are like, yeah, I like The Notebook. But honestly, I just think... That men have found a chick flick movie that they can actually bear enough that they could say that they they could tell chicks that they like the movie to get laid. Now that's my theory. Love it because I saw the movie and not not sure why any grown man would ever say he likes that movie just for the fact that it's a horrible movie and that most typically women have horrible taste in movies. <laughs> Oh, the views expressed by Josh Fosler are not supported by at the Jimmy Curve. Send in the mail. <laughs> Send in the email, the Jimmy Curve at gmail.com. Will, you got one? And also, what's the deal with these women voting? <laughs> 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 no, like, okay, the thing that I hate that everyone else loves, 
uh, my, like mine is uh, it's too broad because it's not even one thing. It's just I'm like I've been playing video games for my entire life to the point where like it's part of my like it's my identity, mm-hmm. like that I'm a video game guy. But I never learned how to get into first person shooters. Which right now, like recently, it was Titanfall. Everybody was fucking creaming their shorts about. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's Destiny, which you, which just came out. Mm-hmm. I know you said you're either have or are going to. I pick just up. bought it. I haven't played it yet. Yeah. Despite the 60... fact that I kind of agree with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't get it, and you don't care because sixty dollars means nothing to you. I'm going to let that one linger on. Genuine rage (laughs) for my economic status. Genuine rage. (laughs) This is the next, the the starting topic of our next show is why that is held against me so much (laughs) and not just, no, good for you. Like, anyways, I agree with you about first person shooters. And one of the reasons I do is because it ruined one of my all time favorite video game series. The first Mass Effect game is one of my all time favorite games but i don't know if it didn't sell as well as they had hoped or what the problem was but when mass effect 2 and then mass effect 3 came out they became more and more first person shooters and less and less rpgs because i like role-playing games and i like rpg video games so by the time mass effect 3 came out like mass effect was just a great rpg Mass Effect 2 was like an okay RPG with elements of a first-person shooter, but the the FPS elements of it kind of sucked. And then Mass Effect 3 was just a garbage FPS game and had almost no RPG elements left in it or, or, the, or story elements left in it. Uh, so, and, and the reason they did that, I assume, is because first-person shooters sell much better. I, I would think so, but like that that seems like an odd example because isn't the whole wasn't the whole kind of concept of the Mass Effect series the fact that like, you know, as this grand epic story carries over, like your decisions are gonna have all this huge impact. Right. And all of that stuff was handled very poorly. In the first game it was great. But by the time the third game came out, all of that shit had been handled so poorly because it was thrown to the side in order to to juice up the sort of gameplay elements that they thought people wanted which were which was hiding behind stuff and shooting at stuff which is the least interesting part of the mass effect games see i i, I had a similar experience oh speaking of a game everybody loves that i didn't get into and for a similar reason uh skyrim but hold on let me explain how like my my uh, aversion to first person shooters the closest thing to a first person shooter i've really gotten into is like the Fallout games this generation, mm-hmm. Fallout Three Love and New em. Vegas. Oh, I, yeah, my, some of my favorite games that generation. Um, but the reason I think I was like willing to get into it was because they're great RPGs, and also they have like this game element called the VAT system, awesome. where you can literally just like stop the game, like decide what needs to be shot at, and then the game will shoot it for you. I very much prefer uh, turn-based combat. Yeah. Well, and 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 it wasn't properly turn-based per se, but right. it kind of it it added an element that was basically that gave you that ability. Mm-hmm. And I played those games, and even though they're sort of a first-person shooter, I really got into them. Now, but then the same developers made the um, Elder Scrolls series and made Skyrim. And I was like, well, I love Fallout, and literally like Skyrim, still an RPG. It's not a first-person shooter. It is still an RPG, but even that I couldn't get into it because I had to do the combat. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, and there's a lot of it. And I feel like, like, is it that? If I feel like it's, that must be all it is. Like, I can't get into a skill-based, like, mm. first-person combat game. Yeah, it, it is weird um, when, in order to do something fun, you have to practice and learn a thing in order to just enjoy the thing like that's i mean it's it's almost a sports thing where you can't if you've never played basketball you can't just go out and have fun playing basketball unless you spend some time getting somewhat good at it otherwise you just can't interact with other people on a basketball court yeah which is a weird way to think of approaching art you know, right. if you think of video games as art, like, like nobody's like, oh, I couldn't beat that book. 
Right. Like it's, you're like, no. Like, either you, like, it, it's a weird way that you have to, like, gain competency in order to engage in, like, the media. It's why my wife really doesn't play video games, because there are elements of them that she does enjoy, but she, when she first picks up a controller, she can't get through a doorway. Because, like, she hasn't been playing them her whole life. And so it's not intuitive and she can't move around and she doesn't want to spend the hours it would take to learn that. Yeah, Yeah, no, and I get it because I have been playing them my whole life and I won't do it for those games. I had that experience when uh, I went, oh man, this is just going to piss off Will Doherty. My friends and I in college went skiing, and uh, (laughs) (laughs) and this was get it. This was this was you know fifteen, sixteen, seventeen years ago, and I had been skiing before, so I knew how to ski. And they all decided that they were going to learn snowboarding. Like you can rent skis and snowboards at the mountain. Like you have to buy them. You can you can go on a pretty low budget ski vacation, and uh, and uh, so. They all decided that they were going to learn snowboarding, and I was like, I only go skiing for two days out of every six years. I don't want to spend one of those days learning a thing. That just seems, (laughs) that sounded so horrible to me, but this was like back when snowboarding was very, like just beginning to get trendy, uh, which happened at a time, and so everybody wanted to do that, and I just, I thought, this is a waste of my whole vacation. I assume the the only uh, the only correlation to that I can of course as a uh, poor person I assume it was somewhere around the release of 1080 snowboarding on the N64. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. That's that's my level of engagement with winter sports. My love hate topic is Radiohead. Just don't get it. And that's been the Jimmy Curve. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's just close it out right there. That feels like a pretty good show. That's a tight 45. Uh, so. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I've been your host, Jimmy Putnam. Joshua Vossler. Will Doherty. Uh, and uh, follow us on Twitter, at The Jimmy Curve. Like our Should Facebook page. Should we plug our show? We have a show on Saturday. Oh, yeah. Uh, this should be released by Thursday. So Saturday, uh, Will and I will be performing stand-up comedy at uh, the Pomedy show uh at the backline theater comedy theater in omaha nebraska uh josh do you have anything coming up nothing (laughs) well you're studying for that accounting final yeah that's that's it so uh everybody show up at josh's accounting final to support him Mm. cheer him on make sure you laugh uh at his it'll be funny (laughs) statistical answers yeah so uh Come out and see us on Saturday, drink some cheap beer, laugh, and send your emails to thejimmycurve at gmail.com. If, uh, if you'd like to see more uh, Will Doherty, uh, you can order a pizza from the Pizza Hut on <laughs> Coddington and West A. It's in the Russ's Market. How many drivers do they have? Oh, like 10. So you got a, a 10% chance of uh, Will Doherty showing up at your door. Those are pretty good odds for Will Doherty. (laughs) (laughs) All right, everybody. Uh, Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next week.